the tale of two cities in shambles, one in chaos and another in Avernus. A tiny holophant with ambitions as grand as her amnesia, a fallen angel far from redemption. These are the things you will encounter in Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus. This Dungeons and Dragons adventure is a prequel to Baldur's Gate 3 and is a wonderful tale. It takes you from level 1 to 13, so it's a bit of a long one. Join me as I describe the story that occurs in Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus. Your tale begins inside a large city located on the edge of a river. Welcome to Baldur's Gate, a veritable nest of rats and vipers clinging to the rocky slopes overlooking the Chiathon River. From their high purchase in the upper city, the local nobles, known as Patriarchs, gaze down with veiled contempt upon the common rabble in the grimy lower city. Following the river further east would eventually lead you to Elturel, the capital of the holy land of Eltergard, or at least, that was the case until a few days ago. The flood of refugees from Elturel has gotten worse since news first arrived that the city has fallen. Everyone is saying Baldur's Gate is next, but no one truly knows who or what claimed Elturel. The Patriarchs pay a mercenary army called the Flaming Fist to protect their interest in Baldur's Gate, and by extension, the city itself. The Flaming Fist has gained even more power since their charismatic leader, Older Ravenguard, claimed the title of Grand Duke a few years ago. Apparently, Ravenguard is missing. In his absence, the Flaming Fist has sealed the city's gates to staunch the flow of refugees. No one is allowed in or out. All of this was brought to your attention shortly after you were drafted by the Flaming Fist to help defend the city. Your orders are to speak to Captain Zaj at the Basilisk Gate, which pierces the city's eastern wall. Dozens of Flaming Fist soldiers are trying to control angry mobs of commoners eager to leave the city. Armed with only a vague description of Captain Zaj, a tall man with long black hair and a leather eye patch, it takes you a while to find him. After a bit of searching the area, you eventually meet the Flaming Fist Captain. The refugee crisis, says Captain Zodge, has stolen fears that Baldur's Gate might suffer the same fate as Elturel, of which nothing remains but a hole in the ground. Our Grand Duke, Older Ravenguard, was visiting Elturel on a diplomatic mission when the city was destroyed. Coincidence? I think not. The Knights of Eltergard called themselves Hellriders. A few of them escaped the destruction and think we're somehow to blame for Elturel's downfall. What a bunch of self-righteous rabble-rousers. We're arresting them on sight, but that's left us short-handed to deal with another problem. For that, I need your help. Eyeing you intently, it is clear that no is not an answer. He hands you a copper badge that bears the Flaming Fist symbol, giving you permission to act in Zodja's name. Baldur's Gate has long been plagued by followers of the Dead Three, the gods Bane, Baal, and Merkel, states Zodj. I thought we had wiped them out, but apparently not. These purveyors of fear and death are taking advantage of the current crisis to commit murder sprees throughout the city. As my appointed deputies, find their lair and wipe them out. Eliminate anyone who gets in your way. If you do what I say, I'll see that you receive 200 gold pieces in addition to my gratitude, which is worth considerably more. You can tell that he has a bit of arrogance in his voice. Zaj points you into the direction of the Elfsong Tavern to meet a contact of his named Harina. Once arriving at the building, you find her upstairs playing some cards. She is quick to notice your approach, and you tell her of the mission. Seeking opportunity in this, she agrees to aid you, but first, you must aid her. In the past, she had plundered the treasures of a ship she once served. Now in hiding, she hears that the former shipmates are coming for her at the city of Boulder's Gate. The deal she proposes to you is you stay at the Elfsong Tavern, and if the pirates show up, to kill them all. You agree to her deal, and stick around the Elfsong Tavern for a time being. Killing some time in the tavern, you learn that the once neighboring city of Elturel had an artificial sun overlooking its skies before the city disappeared. The artificial sun protected the city and its surrounding lands from the undead. Additionally, you learn that the Knights of Elturel, called Hellriders, were named so due to their descent into the Nine Hells on horseback to fight the devils. After some time, the former shipmates of Tarina arrive at the pub and a fight almost instantly breaks out between the two of you. Keeping good to your word, you slay the shipmates that are hunting for Tarina. You confront her after the altercation, and she provides you with the information needed to continue your investigation. Northwest of here is a bathhouse where followers of the Dead Three have been spotted. Whispers tell of a secret door in there that leads into a dungeon of which the killers are hiding. You thank her for her time and enter the streets, traveling to the bathhouse. After heading northwest, 
you find the bathhouse of which you seek. Nothing seems to be too suspicious of the bathhouse, just a seemingly normal building. You enter the bathhouse and find the hidden door that leads deep into the dungeon below the floors. Sneaking through, you murder the inhabitants of the dungeon and come upon some interesting things. Firstly, you find the cult of the dragon within these tunnels. They are searching for the treasure hoard that was stolen from Tiamat, the Queen of Dragons. This treasure was part of the hoard that occurred some time ago by the cultists, but was foiled by some meddling adventurers. Concluding that these cultists are not your target, you proceed further into the dungeon where you meet Mortlock Vanthamber. Mortlock Vanthamber is a man in his late 20s and wields a large club. He is surrounded by the followers of the Dead Three and beaten pretty badly. When the followers notice your presence, they immediately attack you and you kill them non-discriminately. Helping Mortlock, he attempts to form an alliance for his freedom. Mortlock tells you that his family has been the ones paying the Dead Three cultists to murder people in the city. This was all in an act to prove that the Flaming Fist cannot protect its people. Once the city notices this, the Flaming Fist will no longer be paid and leave the city, opening up a position for his mother to be the next Grand Duke. If Mortlock's mother is successful, Baldur's Gate will suffer the same fate as Elturel. She is one of the remaining three members of the Council of Four that governs Baldur's Gate, and was able to convince the current Grand Duke, Older Ravenguard, to leave for Elturel before its fall. Mortlock's brother, Amric, runs a money lending business from a tavern known as the Low Lantern. After telling you this information, you let him go, and he flees the dungeon, and likely the city. With a new destination in mind, you make your way back to the entrance and head towards the Low Lantern Tavern. At the docks of Boulder's Gate, you find the Low Lantern Tavern. It is an old ship that was once used for merchanting, but has now been converted into a tavern and a gambling house. Stepping onto the boat, you search the area and find a man in the corner. He is Amric Vanthamber, the brother of which Mordlock has mentioned. Amric works here as a loan shark, providing money to those in need, but with a steep interest rate. He assumes you've come for a loan, but that is far from the truth. You interrogate the man to learn that the mother, Thalamra, resides in her estate in the luxurious upper city. Taking him captive, you proceed out of the tavern until you are intercepted by someone. A cloaked figure approaches, armor clanking with each step. One gloved hand rests on the hilt of a longsword. The other pulls back a cowl to reveal the face of a teenager with brown skin, red hair, and a haunting gaze. She introduces herself as Rhea Mantelmorn. Rhea wishes to speak with Amric, but you explain that he is in your custody and, by extension, that of the Flaming Fist. She reactively reaches for her sword and prepares to defend herself, but you put her mind at ease by telling her you don't actually work for them. You are simply on a quest to disband the threat of the Dead Three. Noting your valiant efforts, Rhea sheaths her sword and explains that she is in a bit of trouble with the Flaming Fist for an accident that occurred. Rhea is a refugee of Elturel and was training to be a Hellrider. She is searching for Thavius Krieg, the overseer of Elturel, and hears that he is in the company of the Vanthamper. Rhea hopes that Thavius may be able to give her the answer as to what happened to Elturel and if there's any way to save the city. You tell her that you are going to the Vanthamper estate and she insists on tagging along. Armed with a new ally, you make your way to the upper city. Once reaching the upper city, you locate the Vanthamper villa and sneak into the overly large mansion. During your exploration of the building, you find Thalama Vanthamper along with another of her son, Thurswell. You learn from Thurswell that he has been tasked to open a puzzle box given to him by the former Duke of Baldur's Gate. You defeat the son and confiscate the puzzle box from him. Underneath the mansion is a dungeon in which Thalamar resides. You confront her here, and the battle commences immediately. She commands a devilish power, and the battle is hard fought. Once you kill her, she utters a sinister premonition. See you in hell, she says. In the dungeon, you also meet a prisoner named Falister Fisk. The short lean man tells you that he traveled here to find out why Thavius Krieg had taken shelter with the Vanthamburs. In doing so, he was caught and imprisoned. Falister tells you that he works with a tiefling named Sylvira Savicus. She is an expert of the Nine Hells, and is currently based in Candlekeep. If you were to travel there, Severo would be able to open the puzzle box that you've collected. You free the man and add another companion to your journey. In addition to Falister, you find Thavius Krieg hiding in a vault. You question the Overseer of Elturel, and he tells you that he has no idea what happened to the city. Thavius was simply visiting Baldur's Gate at the time Elturel fell, 
and he was captured by the Vanthamber once he entered the city. On the wall of the vault is a shield in which he has been tasked with studying. Cunning as he is, you discern that most of what he says is a lie, and force a confession from him that none of this is true. He is actually working with a devil, and wishes to use the shield to send Baldur's Gate into the Nine Hells. Rhea, struck with disbelief at the Overseer's cowardice and betrayal, takes a mournful step forward and slays the Overseer, deeming him a traitor to humanity. After the events of the Vanthabir Villa, you report your findings to Captain Zaj, along with handing over Amric. You gather your reward, but are interrupted by several Flaming Fist soldiers. Behind this wall of sword and steel steps an armored woman with a white cloak and graying hair. She introduces herself as Liara, a high-ranking member of the Flaming Fist and the niece to one of the remaining dukes of Baldur's Gate. You tell her of your plans to travel to Candlekeep to identify the mysteries of the shield and the puzzle box you've collected while in the villa. Liara thanks you for your aid to the city and prepares a carriage for your travel to Candlekeep along with some armor and supplies. Armed with allies and equipment, you travel along the Sword Coast to find the Citadel of Candlekeep. Along the road to Candlekeep, you and Rhea bond a bit. One night over a campfire, she tells you the tale of the Hellriders. Rhea says, It was over a century past that the Great Troubles began. Fiends roamed the lands to the north and west of Elturel. Fields were despoiled, livestock slaughtered, homes razed, and people dragged off to a terrible and unknowable fate. Terror gripped the hearts of all. The city's cavalry rode across the land, striking down fiends wherever they found them and suffering fearful losses. But it was never enough. For every fiend they destroyed, it seemed as though two more appeared elsewhere. The ruler of Elturel, the High Rider, asked his people to pray to the gods for aid. To everyone's astonishment, a mighty angel entered the city the next day. Her name was Zeriel, which means Companion of Light. The prayers of Elturel had been heard, and help had come. Zeriel located the gate through which the fiends were entering the natural world, on the fields of the dead west of the city. Zeriel declared that she would lead the cavalry into Avernus, destroying the infernal host that was amassing there, and striking a great blow against the forces of darkness. The High Rider sent out the Riders of Elturel, now numbering many thousands, with Zeriel at their head, riding a golden mastodon. With a great cry, Zeriel and her army charged through the gate. The legions of Avernus trembled and buckled, but did not crumble. Zeriel was defeated, and the remnants of her army returned to Elturel, overcome with grief at the loss of their glorious general, but confident that the Lords of the Nine Hells would think twice about threatening Elturel again. There were great celebrations to honor the valiant knights of the Calvary, who became known as Hellriders from that day on. Rhea ends her story with both pride and longing. You thank her for sharing and continue your journey to Candlekeep once sun breaks. Once arriving to the great gates of Candlekeep, Falaster offers one of his books to gain entry into the Citadel. You make your way to the main keep, guided by Falaster to Severus Laboratory. A middle-aged tiefling dressed in wizardly robes stands by one of the windows. I can't tell you how pleased I am to see you, says the tiefling. What have you brought me? You show her both the puzzle box and the shield that you've gathered. She snatches the puzzle box from your hands and studies it, but shows a bit more caution when it comes to the shield. When Severa studies the shield, she tells you that it contains a pit fiend known as Gargoth. Once uncovering the mechanisms to open the puzzle box, she produces nine plates stamped with infernal runes. Reading the runes, it says, Be it known to all that I, Davius Creed, High Overseer of Elturel, have sworn to my master, Zeriel, Lord of Avernus, to keep the agreements contained in this oath. I hereby submit to Zeriel in all matters and for all time. I will place her above all creatures, living and dead. I recognize the dispensation of the device called the Solar Insidiator, hereafter called the Companion. In my capacity as High Overseer of Elturel, I acknowledge that all lands falling under the light of the Companion are forfeit to Zeriel. All persons bound by oath to defend Elturel are also forfeit. I further recognize that this dispensation will last 50 years, after which the Companion will return whence it came, taking Elturel and its oath-bound defenders with it. All this is my everlasting pledge. It seems that Zeriel was no longer an angel, but a devil of the Nine Hells. In addition, Thavius had condemned the entire city of Elturel to a doomed fall into Avernus, 
in exchange for some years of protection through an artificial son known as the Companion. Rhea is absolutely disgusted with the contents that was just shown. Struck with grief for her city, she collapses onto the floor and weeps for Elturel. You help her to her knees and vow that the two of you will travel to Avernus and save the once great city from its damnation. Sylvira understands your drive and suggests that you travel to Traxagor's tower to find a wizard that the tower was named after. She tells you that you should leave the shield here, but the voice of the shield calls out to you. It tells you to take it with you, for it will be of much help traversing the Nine Hells. You decide to take the shield with you, and Sevira sighs a breath of relief. It seems whatever is contained in the shield must have frightened the Tifling. Philaster decides to stay at Candlekeep, for he recognizes that he will be of no help from here on. Sevira arranges for a griffin to take you to the tower, and once you are ready, you may take flight across the lands. Preparing yourselves for the journey, you and Rhea exit the building and board the griffin, taking into the skies and traversing to Traxagor's tower. When the griffin lands, you dismount yourself from the beast and explore the large tower. From within, you find a strange otter who introduces himself as Traxagor. He had heard news from Severa and has prepared a plane shift spell in order to take you to Avernus. Along with the strange otter is a holophant named Lulu. Lulu requests that you take her along with you, for she was once a companion of Zeriel when Zeriel was still an angel. The Hollyfin was instructed to hide Zeriel's sword and had the help of someone to do so. As for the rest, she is unable to remember and wishes to reclaim her memories. You agree to her companionship and step forth to Traxagor, ready to leave. As you stand together, Traxagor casts the plane shift spell and all of you travel to the Nine Hells. After a brief flash of light, you are greeted by a view of a fiery hellscape. A hot, stinging air assaults your senses. The city street in which you stand is lined with buildings that are crumbling, if not already collapsed. The ground shudders beneath your feet. In the red, smoky sky, a 400-foot diameter sphere of darkness discharges strokes of bluish-white lightning that strikes the city at irregular intervals. Perched atop a distant cliff, overlooking the rest of the city is a crumbling fortress. Traxagor gazes up at the black orb nervously, utters a few arcane syllables, and disappears in the blink of an eye. Lulu, the Holophant, tells you that her surroundings feel familiar. Rhea is disheartened by what she sees around her. It is the city of Elturel in shambles. Rhea offers to take you to the High Hall Cathedral, where someone in charge may be of help. That offer is soon interrupted by the screams of a woman along with two children. They are being chased by some fiendish devils. The three of you immediately rush to the commoner's aid and fend off the devils. After the dust of battle clears from the area, you confront the commoners to find that they are residents of Elturel. Many of the residents of Elturel had died when the city fell into Avernus, and the city is quite literally split into two. The woman wishes to find refuge at the High Hall Cathedral, where the Grand Duke Older Ravenguard may reside. You offer to take her to the location and make your way there. Trekking through devil-infested paths and sneaking your way through, you find yourself at the High Hall Cathedral. This clifftop castle was once the crowning architectural jewel of Elturel. Only three of its five watchtowers towers still stand, though they appear abandoned. The wooden gates that once let into the castle grounds have been shattered, leaving a gaping hole in the wall. At the center of the castle grounds, the High Hall Cathedral stands defiant. You enter the castle's grounds to find it overrun by devils of all sorts. Fighting your way through, you clear the castle of fiends that attack the area and find the survivors of the raid. Among them is an acolyte named Faria Jinx. She tells you that Ravenguard had took a group of guards to the Grand Cemetery of the city to investigate the undead in the area. Ravenguard hopes that a holy relic there, known as the Helm of Torm's Sight, may be able to reveal what has happened to Elturel, as well as bring the city to salvation. His return was expected to be hours ago, and Faria is concerned for the Grand Duke. Dropping off the family that you've saved, you head back into the city in search of older Ravenguard. Rushing to the Grand Cemetery, you find the fences and gates torn apart, you walk into the hollowed grounds and find a chapel erect in the center. You proceed onward and find mutilated bodies of humans wearing the uniforms of Baldur's Gate and Elturel. An armored man with a shield slung over his back crouches among the bodies, writhing in pain. His eyes are closed and his hands clutch at a gold helm on his head as if trying in vain to claw it off. Unintelligible words spill from his lips, some sounding saintly and solemn, while others resonate with a cruel hissing. 
You take the man back to High Hall Cathedral and consult with Faraya on how to save the man. Faraya identifies that the man is older Ravenguard, and the helm that he has donned has caused him to be in a terrible state. Conducting a ritual of returning, you free his mind and remove the helm from his head. Older Ravenguard comes to his senses and thanks you for the aid that you've provided. He tells you of the strange visions that he had while wearing the helm that came from the god Torm. In his spirit journey, Ravenguard saw a bloodied woman in armor, wearing the colors and crest of Elturol, grasping a longsword fit for an angel. Flying next to the woman was a small golden elephant. He points to Lulu, stating that that is the creature he saw. As an enormous loping demon threatened to devour the woman, she plunged the sword into the ground. Lulu had fled and wandered in a delirium before coming upon two odd, bird-like humanoids dressed in patchwork armor and standing next to a strange infernal vehicle. Lulu recalls that the Hellrider in Ravenguard's vision goes by the name of Yale, Zeriel's most loyal Hellrider. She is particularly excited by the last part of the story regarding the winged creatures. Lulu tells you that the birds were named Chuka and Klonk and are likely to be Kenkus. She recalls that they belong to a fort in Avernus called Fort Knucklebone where they build and repair infernal vehicles. Older Ravenguard recommends you traveling to the fort while he remains in Elturel and defends the remaining survivors. Rhea Mantlemorn decides that she shall remain in the city too, for defending it is where she belongs. She fights back a bit of tears as she bids you farewell. You exit the city and descend further down into the hellscape of Avernus. You climb down from the city of Elturel and land onto the floors of Avernus. The hellscape of Avernus sits under hideous clouds that obscure the vault of the sky, from which the occasional meteor streaks before crashing into the ground. Ambient light continually swells up from just below the horizon as though lit by nine setting suns, yet no actual celestial bodies fill the sky, no sun, moons, or stars. The atmosphere reeks of brimstone and burning tar, and hot gusts of wind shriek across the hellscape to scour the land below. Biting flies, hell wasps, and blood-sucking sturges patrol the area, hunting for any source of blood to feed on. Bone fields, quicksand, bubbling tar pits, lakes of lava, canyons of wailing souls, and salt flats made from the tears of the damned all await those who wander the hellscape. After leaving Elturel, you head to Fort Knucklebone, a junkyard stronghold on the edge of a desolate expanse of Avernus ravaged by rival gangs of scavengers. A fortified compound sits atop a low plateau that rises out of a crater-pocked landscape. At the center of the compound is a hill of rust-colored stone that resemble a hand clawing out of the ground. A pair of Kenku examine one of the strange vehicles, chattering to each other in high-pitched squawks. These Kenku carry an assortment of strange tools. When they see you, they turn and stare in wonder. One of the Kenku waves in your direction, as if telling you to remain where you are. What a deal! Patience is a virtue! Can't keep the boss waiting! He runs off into one of the trash structures. Moments later, he returns, leading a tall creature wearing a long, tattered shift, covered in mud, blood, mold, and worse. The hag's eyes seem to move independently of each other as she approaches. Both of the hag's eyes focus on Lulu specifically. My goodness, the hag croaks. Where did you find such a treasure? The two Kankos present are the ones from Lulu's memories, Chuka and Klonk. The hag in front of you goes by the name of Mad Maggie. You explain to her your situation, and she offers to help by restoring Lulu's memories. Mad Maggie wishes to perform a ritual to reclaim the lost memories in hopes that she too may find valuable bits of scrap left from Zeriel in her crusade into Avernus. You look to Lulu, who nods in agreement. Mad Maggie prepares the ritual, and you help her through the process, fending off devils in Lulu's dreams. Once the ritual is completed, Lulu exclaims, the sword, the sword, I know where it is. Lulu uncovers that the sword of Zeriel is located at the Bleeding Citadel. Thankful for allowing her to revel in the past memories of Lulu, Mad Maggie takes you to her junkyard, where she offers you a war machine for your travels. In addition to your vehicle, she offers weapons of silver along with rations of two weeks. You thank her for her aid and set forth on your newly acquired war machine towards the Bleeding Citadel. Following Lulu's path, you find yourself on a hill lined with iron trees. At the top of the hill is a vampire by the name of Jandar Sunstar. Impaled on an iron tree, Jandar tells you that he has been sentenced here due to his betrayal to Zeriel when she descended upon Avernus. After years of anguish, Jandar begged Lathander for mercy, but it fell on deaf ears. 
You take pity on the poor soul and free him from its iron tree. Just as you release him, Lulu is abducted by Hellwasp and a Narzagon named Haruman battles you. You defeat the Narzagon and follow the Hellwasp into their nest to free the Holophant. Once rescuing Lulu, she apologizes for leading you here for this is certainly not the Bleeding Citadel. Her memory of the landscape has become unreliable at this point and she can't seem to remember the path to the Bleeding Citadel. Lulu ponders for a bit and tells you that there are two sites in which may be of interest when it comes to finding the Citadel. One site is where the demons manifest, and another is where demons are destroyed. The path that leads to where the demons manifest will take you on a series of quests that have you fetch favors for various devils and demons. At the end of the ordeal, you find a crypt that houses the souls of the former Hellriders that attacked Avernus of Zariel. A particular Hellrider, named Alantheus, cannot stand the fallen status of Zariel and vows to end her rule at all cost. He reveals to you the location of the Bleeding Citadel and agrees to help you in the battlefield against Zeriel if the time ever comes. The path that leads to where the demons are destroyed takes you on a journey to meet a devil named Bell. Bell has you retrieve nine adamantine rods in exchange for the location of the Bleeding Citadel. After retrieving said rods, he keeps his end of the bargain by revealing the location of the Bleeding Citadel. Lulu advises you that it'd be best to search out the Sword of Zeriel. Heeding the Holophant's advice, you hop on your war machine and travel to the Bleeding Citadel. As you approach the Bleeding Citadel, you find a great disgusting scab, the size of a large hill rising up from a stinking swamp of blood. The dome top of an alabaster temple pokes through the scab. Many black iron chains of Avernus converge on the building, attaching within the grotesque mound. Lulu chimes in at the sight of the area. She tells you that the scab will eventually cover the entire structure whereupon the citadel will be absorbed into the Nine Hells and the Sword of Zeria will be lost forever. With great haste, you delve into the many tunnels leading into the citadel. You travel through the dangerous tunnels surrounding the structure and find yourself at the entrance of the Bleeding Citadel. Brass double doors stand exposed in the wall of the scab. A relief image on the doors depict a blindfolded angel wielding a sword and carved into the doorframe are beautiful gold inlaid runes. The runes on the door say, Against evil, we stand united. Only the pure of heart can part these holy gates. You look to Lulu, who nods in agreement. Lulu approaches the large doors and is able to open it. A bright white light burns away the blood and grit staining your clothes. Restorative energy brings life to numb muscles as the glow softens to reveal the interior of a sun-kissed cathedral. How light passes through the scab and into stained glass windows is a mystery only magic can answer. The interior of the citadel is one large alabaster chamber, brightly lit by magically created sunlight shining through the windows. The sword atop the dais is the sword of Zariel. The carving on the dais read, The hero who become one with this blade exists no longer. You take a step forward, ready to reclaim the lost sword, but as you do, you are stopped. The translucent image of a woman in her 30s wearing plate armor and bearing a thin scar on her cheek appears before you. As she points towards the Holophant, Lulu's eyes turn pure white. A whisper fills your ear and says, I remember. A wave of radiant energy erupts from Lulu's body, and in that blinding flash, the ghostly warrior, the Holophant, and the bleeding citadel disappear. The solace of the cathedral is replaced by havoc, screams of panic, and acrid smoke. You stand at the edge of a small town of burning cottages, fields, and trees. A broken sign on the ground reveals the settlement's name, Idleglen. Shrieking townsfolk run from the cackling, snarling demons and gnolls. You recall that ages ago, Idleglen was threatened by gnoll tribes. Solander Brightstar, a cleric of Lathander, led the people in prayer to his god for aid. Lathander was moved by the people's bravery and sent the angel Zariel to defeat the gnolls. After driving off the gnolls, the people erected a statue of Zariel to honor her. Generations later, the gnolls returned to Idleglen this time with demons in their ranks, and Yinogu himself leading the warband. Zeriel and the Hellriders came to Idleglen's aid, but not before the town was mostly destroyed. Packs of gnolls and demons surround you and begin to attack you. You fend off the creatures and save the townsfolk from utter annihilation, but stop when something unexpected occurs. A woman's voice enters your mind. Nice work. Take a break. You've got an hour before the really bad stuff happens. You hear a cackling laughter in the far distance. It gets louder and louder as the hour passes. You rest up a bit before the upcoming events and prepare yourself for anything. 
As the time approaches, you notice some figures in the direction of the laughter. More demons pour out, but this time, it is different. A wild, hideous laugh pierces the air and cuts through the din of battle. A giant knoll, covered in matted bloodstained fur and swinging a three-headed flail, charges out of the haze from the west. Gore drips from his red maw, opening a violent laugh. You stare in fear and awe. This is the demon lord of knolls, Yinogu. You fend off the demons as best you can, but it seems as though all hope is lost. The cackling demon lord shuts his maw and narrows his eyes, gazing up toward the sky as a beam of radiant light pierces the haze. A powerful angel streaks down from above, followed by a gold-furred mammoth with feathered wings. The angel slashes her sword across Yinogu's chest and utters a spell. A portal opens behind the demon lord as the mammoth rams his head into Yinogu. The demon lord is sent tumbling through the portal, which quickly closes behind him. After ridding Idle Glen of Yinogu, Lulu and Zariel introduce themselves to you, healing you as best they can. While these introductions happen, the original Hellriders appear on warhorses and kill any remaining demons and gnolls. One of these Hellriders, a woman in her 30s with a fresh, deep cut on her cheek, thanks you and introduces herself as Yale. She gives a wink before lining up to join the rest of the battalion. You also recognize Alanthius, Haruman, and other original Hellriders. As Zeriel prepares to lead her forces through the portal into Avernus, all other creatures except for her, Lulu, and you stop moving and responding as if frozen in time. Zeriel turns to you and says, Yinogu slaughtered those I sworn to protect. I can stop him and others like him. I might have to give up all I stand for, but I could stem the tide of chaos and save many lives from the demonic terrors of the Abyss. Were you in my place, would you risk it all to save others? You look to the angel and answer her earnestly. No matter if you answer yes or no, Zeriel blesses you and a flash of light brings you back to the bleeding citadel. You stand before the dais, atop which glows the sword of Zeriel. Also before you are Lulu and the ghostly warrior, Yale. The Holophant is first to speak. I remember everything now. Idleglen was the last straw. We followed Zeriel into Avernus, but the evil there proved to be too much for us. Asmodeus appeared and promised Zeriel infernal legions to end the blood war, but she had to give the Lord of the Nine Hells her fealty. She accepted and became an archdevil, but not before Yale and I took her sword, hoping it could redeem Zeriel someday. I gave up my magic and memories, and Yale gave her life to construct this place to protect the sword. Yale's ghost says, You have faced many trials to claim the sword of Zeriel. I'm sorry to say, you have one more. As the inscription of the die says, the hero who becomes one with this blade exists no longer. Are you brave enough to draw the blade and be gone forever? You nod to Yale and take your steps forward to claim the sword. Wrapping your hands around it, you pull the sword from its stone and attune to it immediately. The citadel and the scab around it explode outward in blinding rays of light. Creatures inside the bleeding citadel are unharmed by the explosion and find themselves suddenly under Avernus's red sky. Once you claim the sword of Zeriel, Yale's work is done. Her ghost bids you good luck and fades away as her soul passes into the afterlife. Before you set off to confront Zariel, you make your way back to the crypt that houses the souls of the Hellriders. Here you find Alanthius, one of the original Hellriders. Convincing him to come along to redeem Zariel, he agrees to help you for this may be his only remaining path of redemption. With Zariel's sword in your hands and allies by your side, you begin your final act to save Elturel and redeem the fallen angel. You follow Lulu's path to the ground of Avernus beneath Elturel. Elturel hangs above you and the river sticks. The iron spikes that anchor the city have dragged it nearly to the river's bank. Within a few hours, Elturel will sink into the sticks. Hordes of distant demons fly around the city like gnats, and a battle rages fiercely beneath it. Thousands of fiends clash in Elturel's shadow. At the center stands a being wreathed in flame, striking down demons with tireless fury. Lulu points at the figure with her trunk and whispers, That's her. Zeriel stands exactly where she always does, where the fighting is fiercest. You rush to Zeriel and bring the sword close to the Archdevil. The weapon glows brighter, then levitates to hover before her. Confronted with the last fragment of her angelic spark, Zeriel faces an internal struggle. Lulu weeps for what Zeriel has become. Zeriel feels sorrow as she remembers Lulu's friendship. Seeing Alanthius fills Zeriel with shame for leaving her loyal friend to a horrific fate. 
You plead with the once holy being to take up her mantle as an angel and abandon this path of evil. Overcome with emotions, Zeriel makes her final decision. Zeriel's trembling hand reaches toward the gleaming hilt of her sword. Her fingers brush against it, and she grimaces as radiant light sears her flesh. As her grip tightens, she gasps in pain, then speaks an oath through tears of confusion, sorrows, and dawning joy. I, Zeriel, supplicate myself before the holy light of justice. If it should accept me, I vow to take up this blade once more in its service. The archdevil's words hang in the air for a silent moment, and she glances upward in agonized uncertainty. Then Serial is bathed in a brilliant wash of radiant light. Her fiery halo disappears, and feathers burst from her leathery wings. All of her diabolic features vanish as her angelic form is restored. At the sight of this blessed transformation, Lulu gasps in delight, and transforms into a celestial mammoth with golden fur, feathered wings, and gleaming tusk. Returned to her full celestial glory, Zeriel takes on the task of saving the besieged city of Elturel. Zeriel first soars above Elturel within reach of the corrupted companions. She closes her eyes, raises her sword above her head, takes a deep, centering breath, and brings the blade down. The companion rings like a bell and then shatters, sounding out an angelic tone that can be heard with perfect clarity across the infinite breath of Avernus. With the destruction of the companion, the people of Elturel are freed from infernal bondage. A planetar imprisoned within the companion raises the city out of the Nine Hells and returns it to Faerun. Zeriel and Yu accompany the city until Zeriel is satisfied that Elturel is safe. The Chianthar River shines like a golden road, stretching from Elturel to Baldur's Gate and to the sea beyond. The scent of morning dew cuts through the odor of smoke, brimstone, and rot that clings to Elturel's stones. Slowly, the people of the city make their way out from their hiding places to stand in the light of the mortal world once more. All eyes focus on Zeriel where she stands, sword in hand. The planetar that raised Elturel out of Avernus kneels before her. Lulu nudges Zeriel, then gestures towards you with her trunk. Zeriel strides towards you, bowing her head in solemn gratitude. This dark chapter has at last come to an end, and it is a brighter end than I ever dared to hope for. Thank you. Your selflessness will live on in my memory forever. And in mine, Lulu says. Zeriel's tone turns more somber as she says, You have made an enemy of Asmodeus this day. We have that in common now. I wish you strength and good fortune, and if ever you have a need of my power, hold this feather aloft and invoke my name. I shall come to your aid. Zeriel pulls a single golden feather from one of her wings and hands it to you. With her gift given, Zeriel inclines her head, unfurls her wings, and soars into the sky. Lulu turns to wrap you up in a massive hug with her trunk. When she lets you go, she smiles warmly and says, We'll see each other again. The golden mammoth then flaps her wings and soars into the sky. You watch her silhouette dwindle until it is swallowed by sunlight. Hello, everybody. I hope you guys enjoyed the story. This one was quite a bit of a make. About like, what, 30 minutes of a, of a video? If you guys made it this far, thank you so much. And uh, if you liked the video, please like and subscribe. It really helps me out. Thanks.